This is a recording of a clinic about the Oahu Railway, recorded by Neil Erickson on May 26th. Neil um, actually did a clinic for Rails by the Bay, and about what he's doing, I thought it was just really interesting to kind of look at the railway. I thought it'd be great for us as a group because clearly we cover and the Coast Division Hawaii to talk a little bit about the railroads that are there and a little bit about how they they come together. So, with that, Neil, I'll just hand it to you. Phil didn't say that I spoke way too fast and I tried to cover too much, but uh, today I'll kind of give you a little background about the Oahu Railway and in particular um, the Wahiwa branch. But I thought a big overview of, of the railway might be fun just to do because it's something that um, if you're a rail fan, you know how easy it is to go down rabbit holes. <laughs> so for starters, uh, my name is Neil Erickson. I am a rail fan, I guess you could put it, and have been all my life. I am an architect uh, and have been practicing in Hawaii uh, for quite some time. And, and about 10 years ago, I joined the County of Hawaii. Uh, and I'm responsible for all the plan reviews and permitting, but I still enjoy designing and drafting and, and 3D printing. So uh, it's never too far from railroading. Um, the next image here is kind of something that got my juices flowing. And this is from a book called Next Stop Honolulu. And so I've become, uh, had some correspondence with one of the authors, uh, Jim Crittenden, and uh, he's been an amazing inspiration in his railway modeling the Oahu Railway in ON3 can be found online. He has just an amazing blog. But this one got me started because it's just, um, and you'll see I have a whole bunch of images that I think are quite romantic as far as rice fields and taro fields and sort of bygone era that I think <coughs> what we try to do is recreate right just for everybody who isn't quite familiar with hawaii uh it consists of eight islands um oahu is the center of the state where honolulu is located and that is where our state capital is and where this railway was located um, the big island of hawaii is hawaii county where i live and you can tell that it's quite large in fact you could take all the other islands and put it on the island of Hawaii, you'd still have room around them. And there were railways on nearly every island, with maybe the exception of Molokai um, and Ko'olawe, but uh, you know, sugar plantation railways were, were very common and very popular at the time. Uh, the Oahu Railway is what I'm gonna talk about today. It ran from Honolulu down on the lower right of your screen and then you might have to move um, the gallery view or go to speaker view or something so you can see more of this. But uh, it ran out and around Pearl Harbor and up around the uh, far left corner, Ka'ena Point and around all the way to Kahuku Mill. And I'll get more into that, but to start out with, my friend Ian Burney used to show an image like this where these railways were actually little trolleys pulled by mules or donkeys and this one actually has two donkeys, so it's effectively one horsepower. So this was probably around 1869, but some form of rails were in Honolulu prior to this date. That's kind of fascinating. And Hawaii tramways, Hawaii um, uh, little inner urban became HRT later on and, and eventually uh, buses and whatnot. I, I still have a, a, a token from them, but I don't know how old it is. The gentleman that's responsible for the Oahu Railway and Land Company was Benjamin Franklin Dillingham. And you can say he probably got his name from a famous person in our past. But uh, born in around 1848, he was uh, became a merchant seaman and actually served in the, the Confederate War before he started going back and forth to Honolulu uh, on a merchant ship. And around 1865, he was uh, touring the island on horseback and fell and broke his leg. So he became disabled and was able, it was forced to kind of stay here. And obviously it's not too hard to fall in love with Honolulu or Hawaii for that matter. And I think the same reason I'm here, but he ended up staying and, and getting a job in a hardware store. And obviously he was very ambitious and very motivated because by 1868, he bought him out. 
three years later, it became Dillingham and, and Dillingham and Company. So he became, you know, this is the beginning of his little empire. So I imagine he struggled a bit because he did all kinds of things to serve the community. He grew pumpkins and squash and, you know, had cattle and sheep. And where he lived, he had a little farm. But this was the uh, beginning of probably the way he became um, familiar with the royalty in the area, uh, in particular uh, King Kalakaua and maybe his her, uh, his successor, Queen Liliuokalani, and all the big um, players in the community, James uh, uh, Cook, uh, and, or Castle and Cook of those guys, uh, and, and in particular, James Campbell, who uh, figured out a way to pull water out of the ground, which seemed really innovative at the time. By pumping water out of the ground, they could develop um, some of the arid areas of the island. And the Oahu Railway and Land Company was born pretty much to sell land. So he was granted uh, the right to build a railway in 1889. But by 1899, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. By 1889, he started building a railway. And all of the right of way was granted on the marshlands and waterways along Pearl Harbor and out toward the coast. So anything he wanted to build had to be on pilings and fill material. And this little ornate building was pretty typical of the architecture of the time, quite ornate. Um, and this was the, uh, the railway side, right? But it was, uh, it was pretty cool looking. And you'll see a little uh, bit of this in one other station here, but it was very different from the way it is today. And here's the business side of that a few years later. Um, and uh, you can see the little the turret on the other side beyond the, the roof there. But you can see how rural Honolulu was, right? I don't see any automobiles. It was all horse-drawn um, you know, vehicles. And if you notice the stub switch there, I thought that was pretty cool. So this really dates that photograph. Uh, the stub switch in this photograph uh, is the, the engine house that they built. And you can see that everything in this area was built on fill. So the marshlands to the right, and, and everything was built on pilings and then backfilled with coral. And the coral was dredged or, or mined right off the edge of the railway. So they were able to backfill and fill in all this area, which I can imagine being an EPA nightmare today. But uh, further on back behind this station, uh, the engine house, you can see the station way back there in the distance. And of course, coral for used for the ballast and absolutely everything else you can see. And if anybody has questions, please stop me anytime because um, I think I have 72 slides and I doubt I'll get through them all. As the railroad developed over the years, it became quite an extensive yard. In fact, uh, a large balloon loop was constructed and sort of the big reverse loop that we use on our bottles. And that was to allow um, trains to come in and uh, passenger trains to circle about, head back toward the destination that they started or just came from without having to turn the engine or any of the cars. So I thought this was pretty cool image and certainly dates, uh, uh, you know, wh where they are in the world. But, you know, they started to become quite... Um, an important part of the community by this time. The station itself started getting more and more elaborate. Um, this is still prior to probably 1906 or 1908 because everything is still uh, horse-drawn. And uh, the station you can see by the dress of the figures, the people there were probably around the turn of the century. The first station along the way was Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor was unique among the stations. And, you know, to be honest, all of these stations are quite small. It's hard to, kind of hard to tell, but um, this one was very ornate and real similar to the Honolulu original design, where it has a little bit of that ornate design of turn of the century, kind of a throwback look. But I love the little turrets and the balcony up front. And this is uh, very modelgenic. And I, I have lots of pictures of this, but I'll just give you share a couple more. Here it is further on after they double tracked a lot of the mainland into Honolulu. Looking a little worse for wear, you can see the era. If someone can tell me what kind of cars those are, maybe we can tell when that was. Um, and then here it is again, probably in the 40s where it's not doing so great. And later on, it was turned into a residence and there's photographs of you know their laundry hanging out of the sun there. Uh, the railway continued on to IAEA, which uh, is now just past the, what is the, uh, Aloha Stadium, and uh, it's still along 
Pearl Harbor right away. On to the right of the screen, you'll see the water of Pearl Harbor. So this is running along the edge of the waterway and you can see there's a little dock out front there. So this station is the beginning of a pattern that they use as kind of their design standard for most of the stations. So, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, just like on the mainland and probably a lot of places, the station master and his family lived upstairs there. You can see the waiting room door. It's always pretty pleasant there. And the ticket off baggage door to the left there. Uh, the what? Um, signals there uh, were pretty uh, advanced for their time because by the turn of the century, around 1899, they were already using uh, signals and telephone for communications between the station and the dispatcher would do everything with the station agents. What is the gauge of the track here, sir? This is all three foot gauge. So um, a lot of the plantation lines were three foot gauge um, with the exception of maybe Kauai, they had a 30 inch gauge for any of us that model in 30 inch. And there are, were some two foot gauge railways built throughout the islands. Um, but I could go on a, on a tangent really quickly. Um, this looks like it was around during World War II, where they uh, looks like they had beefed up security a little bit. And you can see the, the military Jeep sitting there. This is still the IAS station and it's a better view of the um, Pearl Harbor right adjacent to it. And I love this point of view because I can see this just being modeled as is almost, you know. Uh, another photographic image that I kind of like is the along the right of way, all the material that was used to build up the right of way was all fill, all coral, and it bisected a lot of the farms um, between Pearl Harbor and inland. And you know, this just kind of worked its way right along the taro fields here, this wetland taro to the left and to the right. If you're not familiar with taro, then you should go out and buy some poi. <laughs> Another image of it running along the right of way, palm trees and taro. And on the big island, there's a story of one of the engineers that would save all of his fruit pits and throw them out along the right of way along the line. And even today, there's all sorts of different fruit trees all along the old railroad right of way um, between Hilo and Pahoa. But I imagine that wasn't uncommon at the time. Spreading their seed. Um, eventually, the railway got to this really dark image <laughs> of Waipahu Station. I think it's a very early images, why, and then photographs of photographs and reproductions. I have better images, but I just thought that this uh, one in shadow uh, showed the, um, of course, now I'm drawing a blank on what kind of signal this is when it's at the station, but um, someone probably can remember that. Anyway, I think that'd be um, really fun to model. I got the uh, some materials to do this with. Um, just to bring you up to speed where we are, this is Waipahu, and it's right before the junction where the branch goes up to Wahiwa, and to the right would head you off toward uh, the point, the absolute south end of the island, a Kahena point, a Kahena point, and then to the left would go back toward um, Aea and Pearl City Station and eventually Honolulu. So this became a focus for me, and just the more information I learned about it, the more intrigued I became with it. So someone actually drew this up. Um, you can see the there's some changes along here. There are two water tanks located across from the freight house near the station, and these became iconic for photographing this area and just became really well known as the twin tanks. And if you have seen this area ever that you you probably will never know that the engine house didn't last very long there because it housed a steam, um, excuse me, a geared Shea locomotive that was used sort of experimentally. There were a pair of them to run up the branch and they were housed right there at Waipahu. And this is an earlier version, but going back to this, I, I imagine that the mainline trains would bring the, the trains uh, headed up the branch and then drop off cars for the um, the engine to grab and then run up like a separate line. But it turned out, and I'll talk more about this later, that the shaves were just too slow for the volume of traffic they had. Um, just across the station, there's a couple of buildings there. Uh, one was a Chinese store, another one was a Japanese store, and Depot Road by Pahu Depot Road um, still exists today. In fact, this location still exists today. And the, uh, what you'll see, bridge number 20 was converted from a trestle to a steel bridge. 
and I'll show you more pictures of that in a bit. Hopefully I don't run out of time. Um, this is back when it was a single track line running through town and that store, the two stores actually become a lot more obvious with the twin tanks there. Uh, wow. The Chinese store being much larger, Japanese store to the right. <clears throat> and after I posted this online, I got contacted by a gentleman from Japan who said his family came from both of these stores, that his mother was raised in the Chinese store and ended up marrying a gentleman on the Japanese side. They lived above the store and she most of her early life one side of the street and moved to the other side of the street as she was older so it was really fun for him to see this image and then an image of the stores that i have later on this is prior to 1919 because there's no um, engine house and it's still a single track line <clears throat> um, you can see the, um, the enclosed water tank here so this is again prior to about 1919 the freight house with the station beyond and then the Japanese store behind that enclosed water tank, excuse me, the Chinese store. So they had their store downstairs and their, uh, their living quarters upstairs. Again, you can see the coral running along the edge of the right of way. And all this on the left hand side is um, rice. It's not sugar cane, it's rice. So that's a, a passenger train, Neil. How often did the passenger trains run along this line? Do you, do you have a good feel for that? Frequently, very frequently. In fact, once the signaling went in, they were staggered about five minutes apart. Uh, I do have a schedule from around the 1937, I think, but the ones th of this area around era of 1919 or before go for hundreds of dollars. And I'm just not really that interested in spending that kind of money, but um, hopefully someone will share them with me. Uh, the uh, Railway Society in Oahu is very generous, but I can't re reproduce them here, of course. Uh, this is a blow up again of that same image showing the freight house, Waipahu station beyond the enclosed water tank. Don't ask me why it's enclosed. It never gets to frost here, but um, it's very unusual. And then the Chinese store living quarters above. And it looks like an old board and batten style, which was very common for the era. So which, what's fun about this, it gives me an idea of what I, I could do to model them. Uh, from the other point of view, um, the, the Japanese store to the right, the Chinese store beyond, uh, the, the water tank. And you notice that this one has some automobiles, maybe a Model T. But uh, this is still prior to 1919 because it's still a wooden trestle. The Waipahu station beyond to the left. And this is Dillingham's private car, number 64. And I'll show you a couple more images of that because it's, uh, it's actually a very little short um, passenger car, but it's very well appointed. Anyway, this whole scene looks so monogenic to me. I just love it. Today, it's not so much so. Bridge number 20 is uh, now encamped uh, in an encampment. And anything that was there beyond this headed toward Aiea and Honolulu is long gone. On the left, you can see um, just beyond where the station would have been. And there's a transfer station for rubbish to the right and beyond that is a brand new fire station and then the old right away became comes a bicycle and pedestrian trail that goes quite a ways i haven't actually had a chance to get on that but anything that was a uh, any remote anything remotely related to the railway on the left hand side is long gone i gave this guy all my change he was super happy to let me take pictures <laughs> Again, here's number 64. Um, this is uh, another point of view of that same area, the Waipahu Station, the freight house, and the store beyond. Uh, and yet another view after 1919, somewhere maybe 1923 or beyond. But this one you can see is probably after 1921 because the branch, uh, the little switch that went into the engine house on the right is no longer there. This is the only photograph I've found of that little engine house for the Shea. And it wasn't a little Shea. So um, the, the shoe fly around the bridge that was gonna be removed was never removed during the rest of the life of the railway. You can see that beyond the station. And, and uh, to the left, the twin tanks. And of course, what I love about this image, and, and I think that most people that model uh, steam locomotives just love the sound of a double-headed locomotive you know, pulling a heavy train. 
So this is coming off the branch. It's probably loaded with sugar cane cars or sugar cane or bags of sugar cane because it's not a pineapple uh, train. As a side note, All folks, right. if, if you're able to follow along on Google uh, Earth or Google Maps, you can actually see the trace of the line that he's covering as we go along. I'll bring up another map too in a moment. So I, yeah, I'm sorry. I meant to, to have a little way to follow along. Um, I just wanted to share this image with the twin tanks and this uh, K-28 uh, locomotive, uh, sometimes known as a mud hen, if you were in the Colorado Rockies. Uh, and uh, I just think this this is one of the larger locomotives on line. It was probably during the war area. You can see the shroud over the, the headlight. Yeah. So uh, speaking you know, of maps, was there, was there any are. explanation for the double tanks? <laughs> Not at all, except every train stopped here before it went up and came down the branch and headed onto Honolulu. And they probably had- And the, there was a tank to the right-hand side. They had the model- Probably the had a what? Mainline trains too there. Um, I noticed if you go back to the previous photograph, um, I'm kind of following along with you on, uh, on the book. <laughs> oh, uh, next stop Honolulu, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So that one, uh, no, no, not that one, the one where you showed the, the and there was one in between there where you showed Waipahu. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, this is end. all Waipahu, but it's it's right where the junction occurs in this image. Yeah, they're saying that was taken in 44 when they were double and triple heading troop trains up to Schofield Barracks. Ah, yes, that's right. And um, I'd, I'd love to share every photograph I have, but uh, there were a family, uh, three sisters, I call them, uh, number 34, 35, and 36 were all two eight O's, and they often ran in pairs or occasionally in, in triple headed. And so I can't imagine how cool that would be. But I was, let me get to a little bit further on and I'll come back to the Wahiwa branch. Um, by the way, you can see here that uh, the railway ran along Pearl Harbor to basically get out to what they call the Eva Plain. And just down in the image below the word Waipahu, you'll see Eva Mill. And Eva Mill was there because of the water and the ability for the railway to haul sugar. Uh, but really, this whole area was was developed. It's still real a lot real rural for a long, long time. But today, they're building probably three dozen houses a day. This, this area is still growing 120 years later. Oh, let me go back to one second. If you if you notice that the far left corner of the image is and a point, and uh, this was the most photographic, uh, most photographed uh, image area to uh, well, taking the train. I don't know how to put it, but uh, it's very, very popular. Very sharp curve there to get around the point. At any rate, uh, Waipahu had a sugar mill that was started by Benjamin Franklin Dillingham. And, you know, he made a deal with pretty much all the areas that had sugar mills in order to haul their cane into Honolulu and to the docks. Uh, this one is uh, the Oahu sugar mill that's just above Wa uh, Waipahu. And I just love all the little camp houses there to the left and maybe the, uh, the Japanese building right in the middle. It might have been a temple. I have no idea. That's a temple. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Depot Road headed up to the mill. Uh, you can see there's two stacks there in the distance. But uh, again, Waipahu Station on the image up to the right and down on the lower lower right, uh, you know, a view of it with no trains for, for a change. But what, this Depot Road was the one that uh, got me going on this whole area because I, I suddenly I just envisioned this as forced perspective. And every building I build is going to be a little bit smaller just to give you that idea of going up the hill. Anyway, uh, if you've ever played around with SketchUp, uh, Phil in particular, this is called a program called Photo Match, and you can sketch over the, the image and uh, you set your vanishing points. And then if you know any given dimension, you can scale it. So, it, you know, it took me a little while to get this together, but it came out really cool. And of course, as soon as I got the sides and, and, and someone else sent me an image of the actual hand-drawn <laughs> station. Oh, well, it always happens that way, right? But I can compare the two as far as the, <laughs> the other. The cool thing about that is you actually have an interior layout, too. Yeah, yeah. Which sort is of, actually yeah. unusual upstairs, to get yeah. for a lot of buildings. And they, they actually, um, 
the Hawaii plan, um, the Hawaii Society, Redwood Society, is going to build a replica of this uh, for their um, visitor center. Only they're going to make it somewhat larger for some reason, but whatever. But if you notice, and, and I don't know if anybody knows the difference, would know the difference. This is actually not an image of the Waipahu station. This is actually a drawing of the IAEA station because it doesn't show that little storage area that's shown on the floor plan. So talk about getting into the rivets, right? Um, a little further on, uh, Eva Mill. This is now where the uh, Hawaii Railway Society is located, the Eva Station. And uh, very, you know, rustic looking, very small little station, probably just across the street from where the station master lived, if he you know, was there full time at all. But very, very cute little station with that sloping roof. That actually has become really um, something popular to build today, that sloping roof. Again, I used uh, Photo Match and SketchUp to create some images, and uh, I haven't tried yet 3D printing those exterior walls, but I think it wouldn't be too hard. Heading up the coast to Ka'ana, past Waianae, um, is uh, just breathtaking, beautiful. And this point, this point of view right here, you can still see when you're riding the Hawaiian Railway Society excursion train this exact location. Um, once you get to Ka'ena Point, it's quite rugged and uh, it heads through some cuts and right along the edge of the shoreline and it is very reminiscent of uh, some Colorado railways, probably the Central Pacific too, I don't know. You can see this is, uh, <laughs> probably got a Packard or something on there with rail railways, it's one of the you know, manager's cars perhaps. Uh, this is actually headed to Ka'ena Point up along the coast. And uh, again, uh, real picturesque. You know, I can imagine riding the train along the coast there. And this is a passenger train. These passenger trains often got to be 20, 22 cars long with a single locomotive. So not small time railroad. Um, now coming down the Waianae Coast again from Ka'ena Point, this image is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, you can see that all the brakemen standing on the roofs. They didn't have but one caboose, so it wasn't uncommon for the guys just to ride where they were needed. Pretty interesting. And one more image. I won't bore you with any more. Okay. By 1899, Dillingham built the Holly Eva Hotel right there on the north shore of Oahu and used it as a way to attract visitors to ride the railroad. And presidents and kings and queens and people from all over the world came to visit this area. And I should have brought my straw hat to wear today because I think it's probably a really a, a pleasant place to go and hang out, you know, because of the way the railroad, railroad car across the, the edge of the waterline, it created these interior waterways. And he had his little Venice there with the canoes and boats that ran along right in front of the hotel. And I've collected dozens of pictures of this hotel because as an architect, I think it's just fascinating. So looking from the hotel out toward where the, the station was, it was just a little shelter. And then it had a, a covered walkway that went across that little canal uh, on the left-hand side there. And Does that again, structure uh, survive? No, I think around 1975 it burned down. A shame. But this aerial view shows probably um, much later in its life when it was still used as a hotel. But you can see the little structure that ran along the right of way is long gone. You know, for the for the covered uh, loading area. And of course, like I said, I have lots and lots of pictures. This is on the opposite side. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is the the, the ocean front front side, and then there's some images, from other parts, in, including this one. And then you can see it was kind of a grand hotel with all these big sweeping stairways and all. Pretty cool. Um, during World War II, it served as the officers' club. Anyway, headed back to Waipahu and Waipahu Junction, and this, believe it or not, is the railroad right away headed up the branch. And on the far right, itty bitty there on the far, excuse me, the far left, way down on the far left hand side of the screen, you'll see Waipahu and Waipahu Junction. You can see the Y down there. And it starts climbing up 
through this, uh, through the valley and then into the gulches headed all the way up to the inner portions of the island. Um, Wahiwa, uh, the children of the valley, <laughs> is, uh, is located way up on the far right-hand side. But like someone pointed out, this also served Schofield Airfield, the Schofield Barracks and Airfield. So it, it had a, uh, I have a better image of this in the aerial photograph, but once we get into there, you'll see that this right away, all the way up into the upper level, upper plains, was uh, on average about four and a half percent grade. So you can see why they wanted to try uh, the Shea locomotives, but they just turned out to be too slow and ended up double and triple heading locomotives. It wasn't uncommon for them to um, gather up a train down in Waipahu and run 44 cars or more all the way back to Honolulu. But uh, it was a lucky find. This is a lucky find. Um, looking a little bit closer at these, you can see here uh, the, the pine um, pineapple spur there right in the middle and Wahua on the right. And the yard limit sign sort of marks the beginning of the downhill grade. But the line that doubles back from the yard goes up into the airfield. So it was um, had its own line. So I imagine that the train would come up and then maybe back all the way up into uh, the station in the, um, the airfield there in the barracks. So this area, the Wahiwa on the right, I actually cheated, but I'll show you in a minute. Because the this is again, a, a, was a lucky find uh, of the actual layout of the, the, the tracks right in Wahiwa and the um, pineapple <clears throat> cannery on the left, on the far right there. But the, um, a lot of the tracks actually never got built. This was kind of uh, layers upon layers, the way that sometimes you'll see um, the maps are drawn and they, as they have overlay them, I think they, they try to figure out what might work or what was planned and what was actually built. So what's interesting is it actually lays out like um, a little uh, place for the cattle, or I think it was probably mules or horses, uh, a stockyard uh, right near the station and warehouse. And then I imagine that Cane Road was partially paved. So it was a little bit of street running all the way down to the cannery because this is a lot of people live, they still do live in this area. Although I can't find any remnants of this at all. So all of those passing can... sightings look relatively short. Yeah. And I imagine the passenger train that came up was probably one of the few things, even the, even the train that came up to serve the cannery uh, probably broke up in that previous um, yard here to oh, break okay. it down so that they would leave their, their pineapple, uh, empty pineapple cars there, pick them up on the way back. But um, yeah, I think you're right. And, Certainly, there were a lot of other commodities that came up here, and they took a lot of the manure from the animals and used that for fertilizer. And there were entire manure trains that ran up and down the hill, along with donkeys and mules and other things. So, I had another interesting um, industry, I guess, to model. Um, this cannery and warehouse, I think I found two or three photographs of it in all in, in its entirety. And the photographs that I found show only two tracks. And I think that what they did was uh, put a platform between them in order to uh, load both cars on each, each spur, right? So again, he says proposed new siding there. So I don't know if there was a siding there or not because uh, the images I saw don't really have that good of uh, clarity. You know, an interesting observation in that picture is, is warehouse is spelled as two words. Yeah. So at that yeah. time, it was still a warehouse versus being a warehouse. It's kind of interesting just that that must have been a transition in kind of how people presented things at some point. That's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of that. One store, um, one here's square. that warehouse, by the way. Yeah. And the cannery beyond. You can. This is the warehouse that was in the lower, excuse me, uh, on the lower side of the screen here. This is uh, what you would see as you're coming, actually coming down the line, excuse me, this point of view. So that, that right there in the, the cannery beyond has the big uh, cupolas for ventilation. 
I'm not sure what the smokestacks were for. I imagine they had a boiler for power and lights. And well, it was a cannery. Looking... It was a cannery. They would have had to have a big boiler for the steam for the canning process. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had. I, I know when you look at the boilers they had down in Monterey because they actually have a lot of pictures. They were pretty huge stationary boilers that they were using because they used those to generate yeah. steam into vessels where they put the cans to do the pasteurization. It's too bad Steinbeck didn't visit Hawaii. Right? Maybe he did. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> you notice that. to the left of this image, there's lots of pineapple. It seems like they were trying to grow it absolutely everywhere they had space. So it must have been a lucrative crop. On the, um, on the tracks, why are they so much wider than the uh, gauge? <laughs> My understanding is at some point they had hoped to um, do a wide gauge railway and what they ended up doing was putting down all these tra uh, these uh, ties for the standard gauge railway, but they never did. So as the ties were out, they took the spikes out and slid them over the other direction. <laughs> so they basically had something fresh to, to spike to, which was kind of cool. I was trying to imagine what your era this was because the woman in that all white dress probably is prior to the turn of the century. And if you guys are model builders, you probably know how hard it is to find any figures of, of uh, color or any nationality other than maybe German and white. This has been a challenge to find era, figures from this era. Uh, again, this is that spur with a warehouse. And I don't know where it is right now because it's a lot different. Than, it's a little more, uh, more modern. What I really like about this, it shows the outside brace boxcars, which I didn't realize how common they were in that era. But I guess this is uh, probably a little bit later in life, maybe toward the 1940s. Another image of the cannery. And again, I, I don't see any cars there, so it's really hard to tell how they loaded and unloaded with the warehouse to my left. <laughs> And the last one I found is this one, which I think is a lot more um, contemporary as it grew. But I think actually this must be somewhere else because it looks like it's water in the foreground. I don't know where the heck this is. This is Lahaina on the bottom. So Lahaina, the that would be on Maui, yeah. Oh, it does say Lahaina, thank you. I wasn't aware of that. Pineapple, some pineapple cannery. And, and oh Lahaina. yeah, they have them there, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so for those who don't know, Lahaina is on the island of Maui, so it's a very popular destination. So what you see up behind there is probably the mountain or the, the old volcano of Haleakala. And there's a, a number of books yeah, written I, by the daughter of the manager. That's, that's the north end of Maui. Haleakala is to the south, further south. Uh, this point of view, looking across the water, you don't think we're looking up at uh, Haleakala? No, you're looking <clears throat> you're looking at the town of Lahaina <clears throat> from the Oh, ocean. right, right, right. It's from across, like from Molokai, looking that direction. So this is uh, right. sometimes known as, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's a good point. And I, so and I think I don't know. A, I don't know the other islands very well. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a mall there called the Cannery, which I think is where this site is. Ah, okay, cool. Thank you. I've got to delete this image from my slideshow, whatever. Um, this is that aerial view I told you of uh, the spur that goes all the way up to Schofield Barracks. And way off in the distance is the uh, Wahiwa, town of Wahiwa. Um, it's way off onto the right hand side. It's amazing how developed it was even then. Uh, this was the station in Haleiwa. Again, it has a real similar appearance to the others along the railway line. Railway line. Uh, this one has full hip roofs. I imagine only because it might rain more, but they have a lot more gutters. Um, I love this image of all the, the kids. I don't know where they're headed, but it's kind of, kind of cool. Everybody's so excited to ride the train. Here's another that, image of it a few years later. That being up on the North Shore, they would get a lot more rain than they do on the South Side. Well, Holly Eva is in the center center of the island, right? So No, it's on the North Shore. Probably not a lot. 
No, no. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That, not Haleiwa. This is uh, Wahiwa. Yeah. Wahiwa. North Shore. Oh, Wahiwa. Right. This, yeah. Is, this is Wahiwa Station, right? Right up in the middle of the island. So, so what, sorry, were, thank you. what was no. typically upstairs in these stations? What was it That's used for, for office the station space? master or station family master family house? The, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. And that was common along this railroad. So, yeah, I'm sorry. This is Wahiwa, not Haleiwa. Haleiwa Station was essentially just that little building for the hotel. And again, later on in life, it didn't look so great. <laughs> it is what it is. Those stations look very uh, similar, uh, maybe done by the same builder of the uh, Kahului Railroad stations at Paia, and again, <laughs> the one that was downtown in Wailuku. Um, same roof architecture. Hmm. I have to I have to look for that. I wonder who the architect on these were. I have no idea. Would Japanese-born uh, carpenters have been involved in the construction of some of these structures? Probably, yeah. Uh, some of the touches. Japanese community. Yeah, mm-hmm. some of the touches I see architecture remind me of stuff I saw when I was in Japan. Yeah, again, this station was probably built somewhere around 1899. So um, when the Chinese Exclusion Act happened on the mainland, uh, we ended up getting a large influx of um, Asians from all over the world. But Japanese influence has always been strong here and still is today. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where this ended up, but it was um, used for building a uh, tunnel. Obviously, it was labor- labeled tunnel for water, and it was sold to a plantation to harvest pineapple. And I, I don't know if anybody else is a Shea fan, but this one is so strange looking. I loved it. It just, it just looks so, so diminutive. Uh, it's nothing like um, this one, number 44, that was bought along with his her sister, to run up the branch and she was a three truck Shay and only lasted a couple of years. I guess the crews just hated her. She was too slow and uh, just didn't make it, it may make it very profitable. Um, this image of the builder's plate, you know, shows that it was a pretty substantial locomotive. I have no idea how big it was. Neil, but, uh, Neil, uh, mm-hmm. Lima used the same erection drawings for the Oahu and the big West side shades. So it's a 70 tonner, oh. nominal 70 tonner. Yep. 70. Thank you. 70 tonner. Yeah. Well, try to find one of these in ON3 or ON30. I it it yeah. should be fairly easy. If you just get one of West side eight, nine or 10, it should be mm-hmm. a fairly simple conversion. <laughs> Except for going to ON30, which is what I modeled. It. Well, I'm, just shut the drivers in. <laughs> yeah. Maybe on one side, right? Yeah. I actually really like this locomotive. I would love to model that era where they ran shays up the branch. I mean, why not, right? Uh, here she is again before being scrapped. It's kind of sad. But they didn't last very long. Um, one thing uh, that was super important for the railway, besides the coral that they're using here for ballast, was they. They had a, a mine for lime for making concrete, right? So they, and lime was also used in processing sugar. So I didn't try to find that image because I'm running out of time already, but I love this double headed image of the ballast train running up the slope here. And in fact, I've got a few more double headers because this is a couple more local numbers often ran together 31, 32, 33, and 34. They were all very similar. <clears throat> And uh, something unique to the Oahu Railway is that extra sand dome. If you notice, there's the steam dome with sand domes before, fore and aft of it, right? So yeah. These were, I don't know if they were done by other railways this way, but uh, it certainly makes these unique. Of course, they're all outside frame. Oh, excuse me, what's the expression? Yeah, outside frame. Am I seeing a big headlight for backing movements on these two units? It's very common for them to go down the branch backwards. So the crown sheet was covered in water. Yeah. If you, if you know how some of those railways work, um, you don't want to be going downhill and run out of water on your crown sheet of the boiler. So you'll end up having a, a very large bang. Uh, again, another image of uh, 
double heading. The guy standing on the box car just cracks me up. That's a triple there, I think. Oh, you're right. There we go. You can see all three smokestacks in this one. That's the one I was looking for. I found it after all. <laughs> Is that a water car behind it? It may have been. It also could be carrying water or molasses, which was a byproduct of, of crushing sugar. Or fertilizer, for that matter. I had a lot of things. Um, this one's pretty fun because during the war era, they just piled all the guys into gondolas and headed them out. Uh, I stole this photograph off of eBay. I wanted to show you number 85 in its sort of its prime. And it was used a lot for passenger trains by itself and oftentimes with more than just a couple. But near the end of the railway, um, uh, after it had shut down effectively running passenger trains, uh, a group of railway enthusiasts would, would uh, charter a train, usually number 85 and some, and some cars, to do photo run buys and just to take a trip out on the line. And they called themselves the Heliconia and Hibiscus Railway Society. So I, I thought that name was great, and I used it for my garden railway at one time. Heliconia and Hibiscus Railway Society. You know, it's, Here it's it is interesting today. The, no. the Bachman 280, the outside frame, is probably not that dissimilar from that. You'd have to add a steam dome onto it and some stuff. But it's, Yeah, the 460. <laughs> actually, this one doesn't or, have a, a separate sand dome. This one is without a separate sand right. dome. So it's, it's, it's a dead ringer. I mean, well, I wouldn't say no, but for exactly. the two, for the it's close enough for me. For the two eight O's, they have an they have an, a two eight O that was an outside frame that actually is really yeah. pretty close to those. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Jim Chiddux has actually converted a couple of locomotives with the, the third sand dome or second sand dome of the third dome. Um, this one is a four six O, and, and if you if I get here, you can see uh, what it looks like today. It's um, not had a lot of attention paid to it since it's at the Railway Society. Um, anyway, it's pretty cool that it's still here. But again, this is real similar to the Boxman, Bachman 460 outside frame. Is that a Baldwin engine? It looks almost European. You know, that's a good question. It's hard to tell from here, but I thought they ran only Alcos, but I could be wrong. I'm looking at the, at the entry in the book. Um, number 85 was an Elko Cook locomotive built in 1910 yeah cook cook was an english builder i believe hmm. so this unit um, sits on the property of the hawaiian railway is that right hawaiian railway society out in eva yeah so in, in addition to some other um motive power uh these two are used frequently for excursions and there's another one that's just outside the picture here but um, obviously diesels are popular here for lots of reasons. They don't have to keep the boiler standards up and they're a lot easier to run and maintain. But uh, here is uh, number 12 where it sits on the Hawaiian Railway Society property and the way it might have looked in the Oahu yards. Uh, some of the older locomotives have been um, kept not restored, but they're on the property. The um, Waialua engine, the number six on the upper right, uh, had its hundredth, one hundredth birthday, I think, recently. I should have worn that shirt today. Anyway, supported their efforts, and hopefully someday they'll see that running again. Um, I'm wearing the shirt. There you go. Uh, there it is. Thank I'll you. Turn around, show you the back. <laughs> yeah, that's a great shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Phil. They didn't know I paid you to do that, right? <laughs> um, this is the number 64 the private passenger car um, that was uh, made by Dillingham for his own use and, and it actually ran uh, and he took tours of dignitaries back there on that lanai so to speak the observation side of it and down on the lower right I think that happened to be the absolute last train on the line at the time so there were giving everybody the big aloha as they went through town. And on the left, I managed to ch charter it uh, sort of for a belated birthday present to myself a couple of years ago and had a bunch of friends join me. And they wouldn't let me drink or eat on the train. 
<laughs> oh well. <laughs> so it was just still out, fun to write on it. So just out of curiosity, is there any thought, you know, any info on why there is only stairs on the right side on this car? And, and is it is that a more modern thing or is this car built so you only entered from one side? That's exactly the way it was built. And if you notice the stairs on the other end um, go from the opposite side. I think they just wanted a bigger veranda on the back. Right. Well, more chairs. Yeah, there's actually like. a, yeah, there's actually a, a little, uh, uh, like a, what do you call that? A, a, like a, a thing that covers up the, the hole so they can, when they close the gate, they have a little bit more room too. Yeah. That'd be a stylish way and to see the island. I figured it was only appropriate. To... Go ahead. Sorry, Phil. I was going to say no, no, I, I, I said thought that, it was appropriate I... to show. The one <laughs> anyway, I... I thought it was appropriate to use a caboose as the end of my presentation. This was the one and only caboose. And uh, I don't know what, where or why it was used. So, well, the so decaling and lettering is pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, it looks an awful lot like the standard gauge one that ran on the Big Island. And ironically, they only had one year or two. So I don't know yeah. what happened, why they didn't. Um, no if, if you want to reach me, there's my email. And hopefully I spelled everything right. And or you can follow me occasionally on the MRH blog. I'm waiting for them to update their forum because it's just too hard to use. I generally use Facebook to post updates. And uh, I call that appropriately long name the Oahu Railway Wahoo 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 branch in ON30. So if you're a Facebook fan, I don't know, join me and, and you know hopefully you can be become an expert with me, Phil. Or Paul rather. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. No well, oh. what I was saying was it looks like renting that car is a really stylish way to see the islands. How long was the trip you took when you rented it? You know, each way out and back is probably an hour and a half because they stop out along the hotels and there's a place you can get coffee or ice cream. And it's it's it is it's a very elegant way to take a train ride. <laughs> it's no, really nice. pretty cool. Yeah, and wanted, it's a beautiful car. I wanted to add a comment, if I may, uh, along Roosevelt Avenue where the Hawaiian Railway shops are. You can see in their main today looking at it through the Google maps and such, you can see the steam locomotive you showed sitting next to their main building. And one of the yellow center cabs is visible and another steam engine. So you can sort of survey some of the equipment on the property that way. Um, I, I didn't share with you, I have a YouTube channel and I think it's just my name, Neil Erickson. And I, I did a, uh, the day we took that trip with the passenger car, I did a little video of me riding along in the diesel locomotive, and uh, I called it "Putting Away the 64." And it's it's it, you have to be a real fan to enjoy it. But it's just the sun setting and watching that uh, little engine run and watching the guy do it. it was a lot of fun, and I just I thought it would be fun to share with others. So we'll be headed over to the breakout room if anyone wants to join yeah, us. Well, thanks, really. <laughs> thanks, Neil. Really, really appreciate it. That was that was really cool. That's you know, it's it's kind of interesting because every narrow gauge is kind of different. So the question is, is you went, is there as much differentiation between you know, Hawaii and California as there is from California to Colorado? So you know, think about how different the railroads are. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the two foot gauge railways and the, the, even the Kauai 30 inch gauge railway. It's just been, it's really, a, it's been really an adventure. You could spend all your hobby time researching these uh, and even putting together this took me a lot longer than I thought. And I wanted to share more photographs than I thought I had time for. But uh, well, you know, if anybody has any questions or have ideas or thoughts, I'm happy to share with, with you whatever I have. Well, the cool thing is that the research that you have to go to Hawaii, so... You know, for, for some of us, it, it could become, you know, one of those great excuses in life. But, honey, we have to go to Hawaii. It's for research. And Neil has a little hotel in downtown Hilo. You know, by all means, they got to right. come stay. <laughs> no, it's I'm very good. All my other projects. Uh, yeah, please seems, please seems get in touch with me if there's anything you want. So when are we going to have a PCR convention there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's 
I'll get you some good rates. You know, it's only right now $39 to travel travel inner island. So you could probably get a trip from from the Bay Area to Honolulu for about 149 bucks and then come to the Big Island for another $40. It's unbelievably cheap. <laughs> Are there still course, some direct You got to wear a mask. I think there's some direct flights still into into Kona on the other side. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not cheap. In fact, the um, Southwest comes right into Hilo now too. Oh, okay. So it's good fun, but thank you. I'm I'm glad that I'd like to participate more in in this region uh, or or division, uh, but I'm not really sure how. So I'll be reaching out to Phil to try to get some points toward my MMR. <laughs> there must be yeah. at least a couple more modelers. I know Tom Knapp's over on Kauai. Uh, there must be a couple people on Oahu, I would guess. You know, having become more public about my hobby is is brought a lot of people out of the woodwork to to introduce themselves, and I think that's been a real blessing, of sort of the silver lining of this pandemic. And so you're right. There's there's people out there that I had no idea. In fact, a guy stopped me in McDonald's one day, and he asked me if I was Neil Erickson. <laughs> oh, cool! I don't know I if like, you're oh, like the, the famous Neil Erickson. Yeah. If you're like the SP, they had subdivisions. Mm -hmm. I asked him if there was a notice of violation on his home or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're still looking for uh, volunteers for the Rails by the Bay. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Well, I, do, I am doing a presentation for Rails by the Bay. I'll be talking more about my, uh, my model version of this. Um, but again, it would really be better to do two separate clinics one about the oahu railway and one the oahu Oahuwa branch and the second one could be entirely about my my railway it was really hard to squeeze everything into this one coming up for rails by the bay but you know hopefully the breakout sessions will give me an opportunity to share more about what i'm doing and, and the guys in silicon valley um got me really juiced up about putting cameras in my locomotives and being able to enable uh <laughs> see the railroad from that point of view and allow people to to drive remotely in fact, I'm stupidly started scenicking some, scenicking some hidden railway portions, some hidden track on my railway, <laughs> which at first I thought it'd be great. I'm going to extend my, my right of way and you'll be able to watch as you go through this area. But in retrospect, I'm not sure I'm going to get to it if there's a derailment or something. Always take a, a cue from one of these uh, carnival rides where you go through certain sections that are totally black. <laughs> yeah. Can... Well, I've 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 helped on layouts. You know, I've been an engineer on layouts where you go into hidden track around to a helix, and you have a tendency to start amping it up so you can hear your locomotive moving. And by the time it comes out the other end, you're doing warp six or something. You know. Oh well. Anyway, thanks, guys. Thank you. So, did we lose Jay? We lost. We lost Jay. No, he didn't lose Jay. So Jay, you should turn your background off. Do you have your building that you're doing around? So you show I'm us. Sorry. And, I'm and, sorry. And, I'm and, muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm muted talking to you. I don't so know Jay's why. building a shop from actually from some prototype photos that so you have to tell us where where which building it is and where. And he and Fran have worked together to 3D print the facade and. He's got that done. He's getting ready to. Let me unmute and uh, turn around. Yeah. Phil, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation on 3D printing, by the way. Oh, no, it, it, it's, it's, it should be pretty good, pretty interesting for building. So, but this, uh, this was really neat. You have to turn the background off, Jay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to do that, Phil. Cool. Um, yeah, no, I'm pushing. I'm do that. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> Phil, are no. you an attorney? No, never mind. No. <laughs> no, he's just part of the helper service. He's always pushing at the back of the train. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, uh, always, always gone. Hang on. Yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, Neil, um, a as an architect, you, you probably will appreciate this. Uh, the town of Wailuku uh, on Maui, um, I, at some time within the last few years, has done a... Uh, uh, community or town development kind of thing. And they have a whole um, listing of what uh, the buildings 
that are in that town. And this is came up as one of the typical Hawaiian storefronts in Wailuku. And uh, so I took uh, what, what I could out of that document and did a 3D uh, model of it and then uh, shipped it off to my friend Fran and, and he printed out the storefront and uh, did, did a fantastic job. Uh, right now, it's missing. That, that could actually be anywhere in Hawaii, especially in Hilo. It, that's just exactly, so classic. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that's what, you know, that's the way they descri described it in Wailuka was this This is a commercial, this is a Hawaiian commercial building, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we only see about. Can, just the ABC on the. On the <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I, I thought that would be great to uh, do as a building. Um, and as you can see, it's not completed yet, but uh, when I'm all done, that we'll uh, find a place of prominence somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful model. I, I renovated a, uh, a building actually just next door to my office, and it was built in the 1890s. And it has a lot of similarities to that, uh, yeah. except that the corbels were two different sizes and had all sorts of layers. So we ended up painting different colors like you might have done a, uh, a Victorian style building, right? right? And nowadays it's occupied by a furniture store and a, a hair salon and some other things, but nobody recognizes it for what it was originally built for. And that was a mortuary. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, well, they, these were typically- No one wanted to buy it. So I, markets, yeah, I got it for like $250,000. <laughs> yeah, these, these were typically markets and, and things like that. And uh, there was a market in uh, Kahului and I'm gonna tell you the name was Ah Funk. <laughs> so I think that's probably gonna yeah. be the name of my, my market here. Uh, that was a real, real name and it, it always amused me every time we drove by, I wanted to take a picture of it. <laughs> but um, I will send you, Neil, I'll send you that uh, Wailuku uh, community document and I think you'll find it very interesting. 